But whatever. Okay, hello. Uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you the obvious questions about your work and about Dido, because they are the questions, there's a reason they're obvious. Uh, they're the ones that uh, I think the audience would like to hear the answers to. Mm -hmm. um, so what makes a piece of music good uh, to dance to? I'm leading up to Dido and Aeneas. <coughs> okay. Is this, this feels a little too hot for me, the microphone. It needs to be down a little bit. Such a fuss, why is it? I'm in show business. Remember, you're not. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, because I, then I can answer the question. If I'm not comfortable, I can't yet. Um, let's see. Music. Well, here's the thing. Usually, the guaranteed not to, that's, much, that's better, guaranteed not to be good music for dancing is, dancing that, uh, is music that's written specifically to be danced to. <laughs> that's very often doesn't work. It Why? very often doesn't. I mean, there are exceptions. Tchaikovsky, Stravinsky. But then there's... What about Bernstein? I mean, uh, the... All right, so... No, I'm... The thing... Gershwin, I'm, I mean... It wasn't a lot, but it wasn't necessarily written to have a dance made to it. It's written to dance to, you know, like popular music that is meant to dance to, you can't resist dancing to it. But theater dances, dances, maybe, I don't know what they're called, art dances or something, dances that you watch, you go to see in a theater. For me, very often, the, you know, I choose music legitimate, serious music because of its greatness, Great. meaning its fine, its excellence. So, you know, um, you know people, are, people are surprised. We, we, I went to an, uh, a rehearsal once for, with musicians to somewhere on the road to do Dido and Aeneas, and they hadn't prepared the recitative because they couldn't imagine that anybody would dance to that. But it's like, but that's the story. Mm. You know, so, you know, very, you know, it's like people, I get, I get these samplers and anthologies and sort of, I don't know what you call that, variety packs from uh, Boozy and Hawks or from, you know, uh, Nunsuch or from these organizations who are trying to promote their composers who have written music for dance. And so they send, of course, I'm a choreographer, and so they send me this music. It's like, usually, one after another, these pieces just put me right to sleep, that they're written, you know, it's like, when uh, Philip Glass, who's a wonderful composer, when his music first started appealing to choreographers in his earliest music, and, and earliest music that we heard from the 70s, it was thrilling and everybody had to do it. Sure, Steve Wright. And it became easy. Yeah, they're, they're, they're very different composers, but that, that's, that idea, and that, he's been supplanted by Arvo Pärt, of yes. course. But where somehow this sort of, you know, and I'm defending their compositions. I'm not, I'm saying that they're, that doesn't suit me for dancing, mm -hmm. but it suits everybody else. So because you can impose your own time, your own idea of time uh, divisions on this music, you can observe how it's written or not, or you can just use it as, a field to make a dance in front of. I don't work that way. Mm -hmm. So the music, you know, uh, the f like the first piece I did for, first piece I choreographed for the San Francisco Ballet was to the ghost trio, Beethoven, the famous, very famous, gorgeous piano trio of Beethoven. It's like, why on earth would one dance to that for the same reason that one would listen to that? Because it's so rich and so engaging and so exciting and it has everything you need. It doesn't need a dance to it. Mm -hmm. And that's part of it. If you feel, you know, it's like music minus one, and you're, you supply the solo voice by dancing to it, that doesn't work for me. Like this restaurant we were just at, what was that? The Study? Is that what that called? Which was wonderful, and we had little snacks. They give us snacks for mm -hmm. free. But they were playing this music that is that thing of these sort of chords, it's sort of trancey, sort of electronica, and it's chords, and you're just like, okay, here it comes and nothing comes, like there's n nothing happens. <laughs> it's vamping till ready, as we yep. used to say, and it doesn't happen. So, you know, you know, sometimes I'll make up a dance to a piece of music that is not a great piece of music because it uh, evokes uh, a particular sort of tone or a situation that makes a particular dance happen. Mm -hmm. But usually, that's, that's unusual for me. Jean-Francais is an example, something like that. Um, but really, it has to have the, the the easy answer that I should have gone to right away is it has to have rhythmic vitality, it has to have surprises, 
it has to be interesting for more than one listening, like a thousand listenings would help. Yes. And it has to be structurally sound and rigorous so that a dance can not complete it nor compete with it, but mm -hmm. drop right into it and all of the elements, music, dance, the visual aspect and the oral aspect are complete and inevitable. So you don't wish you didn't have something and you wish you had something else. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it is. Um, you've used uh, lots, uh, a great range of, um, of music, mm -hmm. lots of different kinds of, musics, uh, of music, but you've shown a, a very marked fondness for Baroque music and for vocal music. Um, could we just take those one by one? Um, the, uh, because we're going to see them shortly on Thursday. Oh, yeah. Um, right. So that's why I brought them up. Um, <laughs> there, there's one thing, though, before we launch into the Baroque thing. Yeah. Is that in talking with, perhaps you've heard of him, Maestro James Levine, genius. Uh, I share, well, not entirely share, but we, I have had the big conversation with him where I'm not really wild about 19th century music in general, especially program music, yes. especially, you know, held in Laban or something like that, where you go on a trip with the orchestra, mm -hmm. and you know, and now you're, you know, uh, Symphonie Fantastique, something like that, where it's like, and now, uh, what's that? What's that other great one that Disney did so well? The Sorcerer's Apprentice, not 19th century, but the same idea of like this story. There's nothing else you can do. And a lot of 19th century ballet music is like that. Sylvia, Tchaiko the Tchaikovsky ballets, the Dilly ballets. That's not my favorite thing. My favorite thing is the Baroque, is basically the 18th century and the 20th century. In between, I'm less interested in choreographing it. I like mm -hmm. the music a lot. I love Brahms, but it's not what I do. It's like there's already so much there that, you know, enough already. I don't, there's, I'm, you would think that in Baroque music, uh, it tells you everything to think and feel, but it doesn't because it's formal enough and abstract enough, it's horrible use of the word abstract, yeah. but it's, it's open enough where you can do kind of what you want. And the same thing is true with a lot of 20th century music, like specifically West Coast composers who I like a lot. But with Baroque music um, and vocal music where they intersect, to me that's also, you know, vocal, Singing and dancing to me are very much related because there's no equipment. It's just you doing these moves or making these sounds. So that to me, it's already the dancer and the singer stand alone, even in groups of people. That's all. Because the, it's physical. The, yeah. Because the voice is yeah. coming out of the there's body. There's nothing to hide behind. There's no euphonium to hide behind. So in, 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 uh, am I wrong in attaching the idea of poignance to that. Okay. I, no, thought I, not a, no. I thought I wasn't wrong. No, you aren't wrong. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> As usual. Um, the, uh, uh, well, in any case, on Thursday in Dido, you'll see um, both of those things and uh, in, in small forces, which makes it more exposed. Um, uh, Dido is my favorite favorite Mark Morris piece. I won't be here on Thursday night, but I envy you. And I particularly envy anyone who's seen it for the first time. Wait a minute, that's your favorite dance? Your favorite piece, really? It's its 20th year, you know that? Yeah, I've seen it a lot of times. Wow, that's great. I'm glad, I kind of, I wasn't sure about um, that. Nice actually, you know, I mean, when you get into that league and, and uh, um, uh, into a very high league with uh, such a large corpus of work. You know, you sort of talked about the lily and the rose. You know, you don't. Uh, I mean, actually, for uh, 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 in a way, for certain things, I'd you know. Uh, but but I, I would say, and I'm sure the uh, the audience will understand what I mean, and I'm sure you will too. If I said something is closest to my heart, that's different from my favorite or the mm -hmm. best. I didn't say the best. Oh, I know. No. Yeah. Uh, the, <clears throat> but, you know, um, the one I'll remember on my deathbed. How about that? You won't remember a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remind you. The, uh, no, but that's, that's the thing. You know, it's, it's, 
my favorite dances of mine, or the dances that are closest to my heart, change all the time. To me, it's not just it's yes. not just the one uh, I'm working. Everybody always says like the piece I'm working on now is the one. Yes, yes, blah, blah, big blah. liars. It's the big also the lie about loving all your children equally. Yeah, yeah, please. yeah. Nonsense. <laughs> It's like you're special. Yeah, you're fine. Okay, yeah. <laughs> go get mom. Go get some, the cigarettes out of mommy's purse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you play the accordion. Yeah. What was it in? I know you, that you worked on Dido for many years. Is there a non-important reason for that? Is that just because you were interrupted all the time? What What was it about Dido and Aeneas? Dido and Aeneas was Purcell's. Uh, is, it was written by Purcell, 1689. Um, it's considered the first uh, English opera. Huh? Um, uh, it's quite short. How long was it? And it's kind of the last one until Britain, I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> that, yeah, they it talk big, about sorry. it a lot because uh, yeah. uh, they uh, forgot to write opera. There's a little problem about English opera. Yeah. English opera was Handel and Italian opera. Yeah. That was the, the problem. Yeah. yeah. The, um, but uh, um, what was it about Dido that snagged you? Something just got better. It's the lights went out. Oh, great. Like, okay. Let's see. Okay. No, ah! ah! Okay. okay. <laughs> it's like at the end of the drive-in movie when yeah. all the cars start up at the same time. Um, Di well, I didn't work on it for years, did I? Um, I thought you did, but you I know better. I think I was just thinking about it for a long time. Um, what, what, what do you want me to answer about? Well, if you worked on it for years, that could mean a number of different things. It could be that you got interrupted. It could be that you didn't know quite what to do with it. Um, uh, I know that you changed your mind. Uh, I'm gonna, mm -hmm. Now I'm going to bring up the fact that you originally thought you were going to dance all the rules right. yourself. Right. My first thing, this, it's a very dramatic and sad and kind of dumb story now. Um, but I have to tell you, and whenever this was, 1980-something, 9? 89 is the date of the production. Yeah, OK. Um, this was long ago, and you may not remember it personally, what was happening at that time, but I had a lot of friends who were dead and dying of AIDS. And to me, I just assumed, because I'm selfish, that I was next. And I wasn't sick, and you know, not that that matters, but it, I thought, this is, everybody's dying. And if, before I die, let me make up this dance about uh, love and sex and death. Like, you know, all good dances, all good art is basically about those things. So I thought, and it was a little, you know, looking back on it, it was a little histrionic, literally. And I thought, let me make up this, my last dance. I thought it was my last dance, and this was 20 years ago, so it evidently is not. Um, <laughs> but I thought, let me do this deep, fabulous, beautiful, rich, terrifying score as a solo. And I thought, you know, I actually, believe it or not, I was approaching it sort of humbly and sort of from a Buddhist perspective as much as I could at the time. Um, and I was also scared to death, and I thought, let this be something, my letter to the world. So I was going to do Dido and Aeneas. It could have been good, but you know, I was too, I was going to do it as a solo performance. And I was going to do it with, you know, full orchestra and chorus and solo singers and just sad me. Um, and then I decided it wouldn't really work that well. I'm thinking, like, how do you do the sex scene? <laughs> and, you know, when you turn around, like, when you show your hands backwards, like, you're, make, <laughs> you're making out with yourself, which is good practice. Um, I really, I, I was actually going to do that, and I was thinking about doing this dance. It's like, well, you know, maybe I need another couple of people. <laughs> and so, you know, I added a dozen people, as it turned out. And I really, but I was, it was really going to be a solitary excursion and a real sort of tour de force, tour de, you know, a real tragedy. So I just decided that was a little bit, uh, you know, it was a little, there were too many violins involved. I decided to make it a little more stoic. It was a little bit boo-hoo. And so I staged this, I, I made up this dance, and we, we worked for months. I made this up in Brussels when my company was the, uh, what was it called? The Monet Dance Group, Mark Morris, at the Teatro uh, Royal de la Monet in Brussels. And I... The wonderful thing was I had all, the, all of the things I wanted, a studio, musicians, theater, budgets, costume. You know, it was one health insurance. It was wonderful. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I started making up this dance, and I decided to do it really as, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of a funerary urn. You know? So I made up the, the court dances of Dido 
and where she meets Aeneas are very, very formal in what people, you know, you always use the, that ghastly term like it's, you know, a, a vase come to life or it's like a freeze. You know, it's like, so it's sort of flat. Afternoon of a point. Yeah, it's like, okay, fine, we all know what that is. And, and, you know, it's really just so you can see every angle of everything. That's why you do that. Um, so I made up these very formal dances and then I made up chaos dances for the sorceress, her nemesis, and did the story much more big and much more dramatically than I thought I was going to do it. And I choreographed it from the background forward. So the first thing I set choreographically was the hardworking and underappreciated often core, the, co the people who are the courtier and conscience and the witches and the sailors, just like the chorus of singers are. So I choreographed all of that first to establish the situation. Then I choreographed the soloists, and then I choreographed the principal parts. And I kept the parts of Dido and uh, the sorceress for myself because I thought, why not? You know, I'm a fabulous dancer, and this could be a really good and interesting thing. And it also, I'd already given up the idea of a solo, <laughs> so I had to keep something. And so um, I made this dance. Actually, I set the parts. I choreographed Dido on... Uh, Ruth Davidson, who was in my company, and I set the sorceress on uh, John Menzinger, who was in my company. So I choreographed it on other people and then learned it. Because the worst thing you can do, like singing in the shower when you sound so fabulous, is thinking that what you're doing as a dancer through improvising is interesting or important. So, you know, dancing around at home, you feel great, but you don't necessarily want to watch all of that. <laughs> So I could edit it and then learn it instead of, you know, going too far. So the dance became a, a, a piece for, tw is it 12 people? Or is it 13? Yeah, something like that. 12, yeah, I don't know, a dozen people. And it was set and established and premiered in Brussels in 89, and we've been doing it for off and on for the last 20 years. I gave up performing it a few years ago, and I just couldn't because it was ridiculous. And... We brought it back for the 25th anniversary of my company with two dancers sharing the lead part. So somebody was Dido, another person was uh, the sorceress, which to me didn't really hold, the integrity was lost in a certain way. And it was wonderful and they were great. But since then, I have two people who do the piece all the way through now. So, a, so a man and Amber. A woman. Uh, Amber Dara Dara. will be the sorceress and Dido, and then Brady McDonald will be the. So it's the so source was actually oh, here only Brady McDonald is because Amber's about you know eight ten months pregnant yeah like yeah. eleven months pregnant yeah <laughs> she's very pregnant and that would be great but you know it's tiring the um, <laughs> anyone who knows uh, anyone who's coming to this performance and doesn't know the story of Dido and Aeneas I would suggest that you either get to the show early so the, usually the Mark Morris dance groups program notes are pretty full uh, in terms of... Well, there's my very concise synopsis, but then oh. there's also the libretto is usually in there. Okay, if his, uh, or just Google Dido. Um, this is uh, uh, one thing that's quite um, uh, uh, very striking about Dido and Aeneas is that it's such a compact tragedy. It's from Act Four of the Aeneid, but what's so, uh, without going too deeply into it, it's about the individual versus the world, the world's needs as opposed to one little individual's needs. Uh, Aeneas, who's a, um, a Trojan prince, has to go and establish Rome, um, the, uh, whose destiny is to rule the world. And on the way, he stops off in Carthage and meets the queen and has a love affair. Uh, so think of AIDS when you think of this. This is a brief love. Um, and uh, she, she knows better, as we know from the very beginning of the dance. Mm -hmm. She says, I know better than to do this. I must not do this. And her courtiers all say, oh, go ahead. <laughs> He's handsome. It'll well, she's also, she's a widow. She's a widow. A and, young widow. And she, oh, and she has her own country to rule, mm -hmm. uh, her own kingdom to rule, Carthage. And she's a responsible person. Um, and, uh, but everyone says, ah. You know, come on, have a good time. And, uh, um, and anyway, she's, she's sacrificed uh, quite swiftly. Uh, and there's a wonderful scene uh, in, in the ballet uh, of the sailors. The Corps mm -hmm. has three uh, 
uh, uh, em embodiments. They, the courtiers, the, the witch's coven, which is not in the Aeneid, but the sailors. And the sailors, in a way, personify just the world's necessities. Mm -hmm. Not evil, not good, just the world, Let, which is let's get going. Right. And kiss your girlfriends goodbye and tell them you'll return and ha, 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 we know right. you won't. But the world has its necessities. Um, anyway, that, uh, if you want to think of... Oh, everybody's checking their phones now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind anymore. Um, I've given up on that. The, uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the, um, I just said that the ensemble has you know, three identities. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, that in, in that, that all that adds up to humanity, a humanity, and, and that to, to, I'm going to try and prove my point for a second. The, the set uh, has, there's a beautiful backdrop, the set by Robert Bordeaux has a beautiful backdrop, which is um, the sea. Uh, is it the Aegean or? It, it, it's, it's a map. All oh, right, it's much. a map. <laughs> yeah, and, the and there's yeah, a pretty much floor it. cloth which repeats it or extends it. Uh, are we being, is it being suggested to us that this is about the world? That it's, or do all sort of uh, ambitious classical works suggest that? Oh my god, what a question. Sorry. Wow. You can say I don't have much book learning, Joan, but I'll tell you. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the thing here's the thing, this right here's where it is. It's in Carthage, yeah. and over yonder is Rome. That's what it is. Rome. Whenever That's you where see, he's got to go. Yeah, whenever you see anybody go like this, <laughs> they're looking into the future into Rome. That's why he has to leave her. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's meant to be a sort of slightly mysterious map of ocean and. Islands and you know stuff, a balustrade. I don't know. It's it's home and it's across the across the way. It's there. That's why it's all ocean. When there's a there's a great thing in there's a great thing. The next chapter starts with um, Aeneas sailing away and die. I mean, this isn't. It's hard to get this in the dance, but it's implied that you know. Of course, she has her sister Belinda die. I mean, not her sister. What's her name in the in the book? Yeah, I know. Um, but it's Belinda in the, in the Purcell, and she collects all of her stuff and makes a, a fire to burn his belongings, and her sister doesn't realize that she's going to kill herself. So she steps into it. It's like, oh, shit. Why didn't I see this coming? So she's burning, and then the next book opens with him having sailed away and looking back to the shore, and there's a column of smoke, which is her. It's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I just, you know... I really liked her, but I couldn't stay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and the, the thing is, of course, it's actually the gods who make him go away. And in the Purcell, it's a more complicated kind of crazy show business thing with someone impersonating Mercury, yes. who's a personification of the sorceress, etc. But it's the same idea. It's like, oh, no. What do you do yeah. now? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, but, you know, very often in our literature and in our ballets, there are agents who are sent to give us an excuse for the bad things that we do. But I think underneath, it's supposed to be under, in Swan Lake, you know, Odile comes to fool Siegfried and make him betray Odette. But I think we're supposed to understand that he made the mistake. He, he did it. Sure. Uh, <laughs> Man, yuck. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, the... Um, uh, the, uh, uh, all right, um, could you talk about something that I think the audience will be very interested in, which is the extremely complicated and rich use of hand gestures oh. in Dido. Uh, sure. Uh, the, the, there are an awful lot of very complicated and emphatic hand gestures. Where did they come from and what were you up to? It's mostly that they're specific and they're strange because they're that's right they're, they're very extreme they're yep. extreme it's not like this or like this well it's not the f the hand, the barbie hand that most dancers put on the end of their arms <laughs> it's like oh great 
how do you open a bottle with that? I don't know. Uh, no, if it's MERS, you can, you can only open a bottle with it. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, let's see. I was very, well, first of all, I'm a very, very big fan of South Indian uh, dance, specifically, well, Indian dance, South Indian music. I'm a big, big fan and amateur of Indonesian dance and music. What's the matter? What do you need? I, I didn't ring the clock. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, someone will start oh, yawning. Oh. You'll, oh, look, there's one there. OK. <laughs> I haven't even started my answer. Oh, my no, God. Okay. I'm sorry. I just realized. <laughs> it's like, OK, that's about All right. No, sorry. I don't. Um, OK, here's what happened. I was very, uh, I, I meant this, this dance is, hmm. We, from the very minute we started rehearsing it, I taught only a modern dance class to my company. And I usually teach a ballet class to my company. We rehearsed only in sarong, uh, these Indonesian garments. And it's so, um, I, I, I don't know if I'd been there recently. I don't think I had. It's just something I liked very much. So I'd been watching a lot of uh, Indonesian dance, Indian dance that I love so much that I can't learn it because it's so over my head. And I'm a big, a big, big fan. So I wanted to communicate, I wanted this dance to be set somewhere that's not, that wasn't Brussels, for one thing. So it's not, it wasn't exactly Indonesia, it wasn't exactly Carthage, the story is, you know, it's in English, etc. So I choreographed the whole thing with everyone wearing sarong, and they still are, the costumes are sarong. And I wanted to have this very low slung uh, uh, posture and, you know, hip, this, uh, these sort of angles that are achieved only through dances from the tropics. This is, I have a whole theory, we'll talk about this in the car. But the <laughs> cold, cold weather dances and hot weather dances are very different automatically. You don't jump as much in Hawaii as you do in like, you know, the Basque country or something <laughs> like that. So, and also the, the storytelling tradition in uh, South Asian and Southeast Asian theater is very personal and direct like ballet used to be, or like opera used to be in smaller theaters, where it's like, everybody listen to this, watch this story I'm going to tell you. And you understand it, even if you don't understand it. You get it because it's directed at you, as opposed to folk dancing or you know, group dances, the parties, the big hotas of Spain where everybody's jumping up mm -hmm. and down like crazy mm -hmm. that have no stories except in the songs, mm -hmm. or the things from Samoa or Tahiti that have no nothing but a story. Like, that's the only reason they exist. And then it's great rhythm and it's great music. But I wanted to get the story across, because it's a very concise piece. Everybody knows the music. Um, I didn't want to bring a chorus of singers on for eight bars, and then they exit. That's just comical, and it doesn't work. So I made everyone tell all of the story. So I was influenced, not influenced, in love with American Sign Language at the time. I'd broken my foot and studied ASL and wasn't ever very good at it, but I'm still, I, I like it so much. It's such a gorgeous language that can't really translate directly to what I speak, just like every other language can't translate, just like dance can't translate yeah. directly. So it's a combo. The gestures are exactly, much to some people's dismay, exactly what the text is doing. We say all of the words in the dance. Um, it's a combo of very direct American Sign Language quotations and paraphrases and adaptations, and also just stuff I made up because it looked cool. Good, yep. you know. Um, so the the difference, the the Dido dancing, the court dances are very flat and very direct and pointing to the front and very clearly etched mudra hand gestures that are related to the exact words that they would be if you understood uh, Sanskrit or Tamil and you're watching these dance, these Indian dances. So. I wanted that, and, uh, but it's also in English. There's a lot of English mixed in. Then the, the sorceress dances are the same idea. It's still gesturally very specific, but it's chaos. And it's the opposite. It's the evil antithesis of uh, the court of, of Dido, who's basically good yet sad. So Dido's good and sad, and the sorceress is evil and happy. Mm -hmm. And they communicate through gesture and through full body language and through posture. And of course, because it's in a theater, through uh, space relationships between, you know, in depth and facings and all of that usual dance stuff. Okay. Yep. Is 
that answer that kind of? Yes, um, but okay. I'm, I want to extend this a okay. little bit. Uh, um, I want to say, I'm sure it's completely obvious to all of you, but just in case, not every word is translated. Okay. Um, the, uh, no, Mark, there's not enough in the time. Dance. Not every word is translated from the singing. Uh huh. More Mostly, though. Oh, I didn't. Then, oh, okay. then it wasn't obvious to me. I'm oh, okay. the only one to whom this right. wasn't obvious. But it seems to me that a, a great there, thing. Yeah, no, there's a few just get down with your bad self and dance. There's a few of them. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, um, uh, but I think those are all instrumental. All right. But uh, I want to introduce. Oh, okay. to a few of these gestures okay, sure. so that they can recognize okay. them. Some of them are actually figurative uh, rather than symbolic. So, um, um, and you're going to come, uh, all right, the... Uh, yeah. Put them up, Joan. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, the, uh, and I'm going to pick up to part. Oh, uh, part is this. Suit. No, what about mm -mm. the one that's like... What's it's always like this. I know, I just I made it up. No, no, I oh, know okay. it's... I, <laughs> I, I'll take your word for it. Okay, uh, this is this is mine. This is possessive. Mine. mine. Oh, wait, yeah. but but isn't there one that's mine? Part is this, which would be that's you know C D. That would be divorce. In American Sign Language, is two D's right. that you pull apart. Divorce. Oh oh oh. All right. Divorce. Okay. But it didn't look so good. Yeah. So I changed it from a D to this, which is more. But is the is it? Does it goes it like this. So part goes like this. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, that's right. The, the move goes like that. And it's, so it's part. All right, it didn't. But know. it's just it's not know. divorced because it's and it's not a P because it didn't look okay. pretty. All right. So I yeah. All right. Here. So uh, this is what I want to point out that 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 it didn't look pretty. So in other words, they're adapting. Yeah. He, he took what he liked and he made it into a dance. So he you know. Here's a really good example. The uh, ASL. Correct me if I'm wrong, which is uh, learn. Which is basically this. Oh. So learn. Oh, I love that one. Yes. Learn. I use it as remember. So in the in the lament. She says, remember me, yeah. or learn from my experience. So I do this, which is the word learn, but it's, of course, expanded into a dancing thing. Remember me, but... Remember me. But uh, Forget. 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 My fate. And, all right, could you do fate again? Because it's my favorite. Okay. Um, uh, but it's this action. It's not the position. That's the thing. It okay. does that. Now, I love fate because it's... This is good. I want a copy of this tape. That's what I... Okay, sorry. <laughs> But no, it's good, yeah. It's I, true. I like fate because this one is not figurative. Um, we have to turn your hands completely inside out. That's why it takes a trained professional to do that. Uh, right. yeah. <laughs> no, it's hard. I am not a dancer <laughs> by profession. Right, my fate. fate. Uh, all right, but look at this. Or you do it, and I'm going to discuss gonna do? it. Do fate, and I'm going to discuss it. Hold it. As you okay. will see. Yeah, sorry, all go right. ahead. So it's pointing to heaven, so that means something. It's very strong and shouldery, so it's obviously powerful. And it's spidery, so it's a little sinister. So that's Wow. Fate. It's fate, yeah. Fate. But, but also, here's the thing. The word awe, A-H, yes. which comes up all the time, is just this. Oh, that, but that's but good. But that's it. Isn't awe, it, Belinda. Yeah. Awe, Belinda. Awe, awe, okay. awe, awe. Help me. Right. Awe, forget my fate. But I just gave away the whole dance. You don't even have to see it. No, you have There's to There's lots more. There's but I lots want more. them. The, uh, yeah. I, I, I read my book today, and <clears throat> that uh, fate, I think, comes up 17 times in different uh, situations and in different, sh uh, not too many different shapes. Actually, not the fate one, too many different, but different situations. And it's, it's really... Uh, there's a really good thing that happens that never gets mentioned, uh, which is there's a part in this, uh, this wonderful, horrifying chorus of the, the witches celebrating the impending doom of Dido, they sing, destruction's our delight, delight our greatest sorrow. Uh, Elissa uh, dies. dies tonight and Carthage flames tomorrow. That's like, so, that's so fabulous, yeah. these couplets. <laughs> it's so great. And what happens is it's a, dan a dance of glee. And in part of it, the dancers improvisationally, because they're the witches and they can't be held to the rules of the court, they're they're loose cannons. And so everyone, and this is quite improvised, it's rhythmically very accurate, and the structure is set, but everybody gets to do their own thing, which is they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So everybody like, applause, you know, applause, hooray, we love this. Alyssa dies tonight, and everyone kills themselves. And mm -hmm. so 
they do it however they can. They just have a few bars and it's really fast. So people are like taking pills and slashing their wrists and, and shooting themselves. There's like, a heart whatever you want. Yeah. However you want. You hang yourself, whatever you can get in. Yeah. And then people explode. You know, it's like this horrible. And they go like this. It's like, hooray, she's going to kill herself. Yeah. Yeah. What's better than that? Yeah. Yeah. We, we won. Yeah. So, but that's super specific, mimey kind of stuff, yeah. but it's also fully improvised. Yeah, great, great. The, uh, um, it's, uh, and there's some sex stuff that's improvised too, isn't there? Mm. It's vile. <laughs> the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the utter uh, lowness of what goes on in the witch's den makes the um, extreme uh, dignity of Dido's uh, lament, at, in, uh, which is <coughs> the last song, um, um, utterly uh, piercing and almost chastising. You listen to it and you think, oh, I'll never be bad again as long as I Well, in this, in, in my view of this, she, Dido is distressed to leave her sister Belinda behind. So, wait, that sounds like that bad Greek joke, but I'm not going to tell that. Um, but she, she says, but I'll oh, forget my fate. She's talking to her sister. It's like, I'm sorry I have to kill myself. She doesn't say I have to kill myself, but she says, you know, just wait here. Everything will be fine. Then she kills herself. So it becomes, in my staging, it's a duet. The, the Dido's Lament, which is, of course, the most famous solo in this repertory of this period. So it's done as a duet, and she summons the help of her court and her friends. You know, Remember so, me. Yeah. Um, I hope I'm, uh, uh, you know. When I, did you last see Dido? Um, in uh, well, uh, when you uh, when you changed the cast. Oh, okay, all right. The, um, the uh, I hope I'm not ruining the story for anyone. I assume yeah. that most of you know know the story of Dido and No, it's not like the crying game. <laughs> yeah, it's that, like, that. oh shit, that was a <laughs> that was the guy. Uh, yeah, uh, the, I never saw the movie, but I told everybody I could. It's like I heard it's a man. <laughs> The, um, the, uh, the, the uh, Dino's death scene is really uh, uh, immensely uh, 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 striking thing. Um, she sings this lament, this famous, uh, and this, this song was used, it was a parlor song for many, many, wasn't it in, in the 19th century? Um, wasn't this a famous parlor song? People, you know. Did people sing it at home? Yes. They were so as I, what I was told was yeah, that really? in that. the 19th and early 20th century, when people, you know, did what they did to uh, on you know social evenings, which is you went to the people's house and the you had dinner, and then the lady of the house played the piano. Um, that was one of the songs that was sung, like the last rose of summer and stuff like that. I don't doubt it. The um, but in any case, that song is sung, and then Dido goes to the back. You tell, what, what I'm trying to ask you is this, and this is a, uh, a question about stagecraft mm -hmm. almost more than art. But Dido dies while the chorus is singing a chorus mm -hmm. about love. They're singing, with drooping wings, uh, ye cupids come and okay. scatter roses on her tomb. Okay, and it's a, a kind of a mild... Um, uh, a tender, mm -hmm. sad song uh, with none of the power of, of the lament. But while this happens, Dido dies at the back, and you never see it happen. No one has ever seen it. No one's ever seen it no happen. One it's like has, Santa Claus. No one has ever seen it happen. It's like Santa Claus. Except it exists. I know people who've tried to see yeah, it happen. Yeah, no, you can't. And no it's one magic. Has, so, but actually, all of you should not try. Anyone who sings for the first time, don't try because there's a lot. Now, it's the miracle of show business. It's called misdirection. Like you, magic. you make sure that their attention is focused on something else, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. just die back there. Okay. That's right. All right. When you get a tetanus shot. The, okay. All right. The, uh, uh, the, um, uh, now, something you said she. Um, uh, she addresses it to Belinda and she asks Belinda to remember her. Mm -hmm. um, um, in the end, uh, Belinda does stay with her. And uh, I asked Mark about the world. Uh, and in a very mysterious, really um, 
almost hallucinatory moment at the end, the entire core, one by one, walk into the world. They walk through a slit. Go to Rome. In the psych. What? They have to go That's to Rome. Right. All right. So maybe they're future Romans. They're, they're, all right. So maybe they are uh, cahooting with Aeneas. You know that. All right. But they walk into the they walk into the world. Um, Let's say they leave the stage. Like that fabulous dance. Do you know that fabulous old Robert Joffrey dance called Astarte? I never saw it. Oh before. my I saw a movie. Did anybody of it? see that? It was the greatest. It was so radical and fabulous. But that dance ends. Well, it starts with this sexy siren on stage, Astarte. Lucette. Yeah. But then this guy who's planted in the audience in that fabulous sort of 60s, 70s, such as like, he comes out of the audience like, what are you doing? And then he's accidentally ready to dance, like he warmed up in advance. And he does this sexy, gorgeous dance. And then they leave, and it turned into, at the time, radical film of the oh like, stage door. And they're, le they're going out of city center or whatever to whatever they're going to do. It's the most brilliant thing. It was a terrible dance, but it was this. <laughs> incredible idea and there's a little bit of that but I you're explaining way more than I would explain that's all which is that's your job I have, I have a different job from I know we have very different the, jobs it's like wow that happens too I have really I get a little bit of that I don't you know you asked me a long time about the world it's like well sure ev but everything is about the world but, that's but all the, we've got when I say these things of walking into the world yeah these actually I would never and not just out of uh, humility or whatever, I would never s probably say that in print. What I'm saying is that there's a suggestion. When a dancer walks through a slit in a psych that is the ocean, there's a suggestion being made. Absolutely. And that you, you ignore, if you ignore it, you're being stupid. Uh, or, you're, 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 or you're willfully <coughs> being stupid if you don't pick up on it somehow. There, dance there. is never telling you anything explicitly, uh, a dance. Uh, well, most dance, unless it's like the swan dies on that, she goes flop, and then she's dead. <laughs> yes, she's dead. But uh, um, I don't know. It's some, it, this is, what is that? You know, oh, that's the door squeaking. Yeah. First of all, I view this piece as an opera. And it's a, a danced opera, mm -hmm. but it's still an opera. It meaning it's everything you can do all at one time in one place. Um, so w one thing that I like about that's a nutty, what's that squeaky, squeaky thing? Anybody? Gone. OK, all right. Um, the, the thing is that when I first did this piece in Brussels, it was set on a, it was on a raised stage in the middle of nothing. And it was a raised stage with ramps coming up the sides. And the film of it. There's a, a, you can buy it on DVD, and it's a pretty good version, but it's not exactly the same. It's the same idea. It's like an island. The floor is here. And the dance, as I like it, when we didn't do it in a proscenium theater, nobody could leave the room. The dancers could not leave. You sat like this on the side when you weren't performing. It was exa you couldn't have a drink of water. That was the whole thing. It was a ceremony that lasted 58 to 62 minutes, depending on the night. So it was like. Once it starts the overture, it's a ceremony of here's the enactment of this tale. Watch and listen and don't let this happen to you. And so, and it's not like, you know, we can do this and you can't. It's like, sit down and do this, which is a very, to me, South Asian, Southeast Asian point of view of how to perform. It's like, here we go. And the character transforms from the Dido into the sorceress just by letting her hair down and changing personalities. And that's, that's what it was, that's how I decided to tell this tale, this beautiful story, by involving a cast of people, a community of dancers and singers and players in getting this. It's a very, very ancient idea to put a, a story across this way. Now, in a proscenium theater, they can exit and they are probably go to their dressing room and you know, make fun of each other or something. But it was that you couldn't have a drink of water, you couldn't fix your lipstick, if something went wrong with your sarong, you're sunk. And if you couldn't get, there's no elastic in this show. There's no Velcro. If your sarong is coming off, that's it. You have to face it like you would, you know, if you had to face something. Mm -hmm. So over the years, it's become easier than that. But really, it's like one hour, these people play these parts and tell you this story. These 
The singers are usually visible. There's a singing Dido and a dancing Dido, a singing Aeneas and a dancing Aeneas, a singing chorus and a dancing chorus. So all of them, I would say us, but I'm not in it anymore, all of them are aiming this story at each individual person. And that's the very, very specific, non-abstract uh, aspect of this show. It, that's what I'm saying. It, it, it's not that it has meaning, it's that it's actually enacted. Enactment. When in, in the Purcell, there's no scene, there's no fucking scene in the, in the music. It's not allowed. It, of course, in the, in, the, uh, in the story, there is. There's a, they run into a cave. Done. In the Purcell, it's a little bit cleaned up, so I had to fit that in. So one of the ritornella uh, in the piece is when they have sort of ceremonial sex, but it's, sa it's sex. It's not, I mean, they don't really have sex, but it sure looks like it. You know what I'm saying? And it's formalized like all of it is. But, you know, she actually does die. Mm -hmm. it, this character dies. She doesn't, you know, if you actually died in the show, you can only do it once. <laughs> but it's not, it's not as abstract as, uh, as I'm hearing as, as other dances are because of the text, the words that are being spoken, the story that's being told. Of course, it's pretend, but it's only, it only, it's only successful because it's true. Yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, um, I, uh, I said what I said to emphatically. Mm -hmm. Of course, Dido's a story. Um, and, uh, and she dies. Yeah. I mean, she definitely dies. What I'm saying is interpretations, you know, walking into the world, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, that's something that a critic does. Uh, what, uh, what I was saying is you, you say, when you're saying these things, which I do do when I write, you say them in a more... Um, ambiguous and tentative and sort of watery way. Mm -hmm. You don't lay down the law. But a lot of dances, a lot of dances, not many operas, are like that, where it's like, hmm, do they get together or not? Or yes. like, oh, that happened in the wings. Yes. You know, it's like, oh, where did she come from? You know, boy, boy, girl, hmm, there's a rivalry. It's like, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. If it's an opera, there's a rivalry. Yes, yes. <laughs> if it's a dance, we don't know. Yeah. But I mean, Dino and Aeneas, you know, there is actually a story. And in the Aeneid, it's only in two lines, but they do go into a cave. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say they had sex, but he says something like, there was thunder, there was lightning, and her fate was sealed. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, there's no ambiguity about what that means. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, the, there's no ambiguity whatsoever. Um, speaking of what you just said about the ritual enactment, mm -hmm. which, of course, is very Greek, too, Attic yeah. Greek. Um, could well, you but so is a, a man playing a woman, the role of a yes, woman. Yes. Uh, a woman's I, role. I thought I might let you, let, you, you let you get away with not Oh, that's fine. I don't, yeah, tonight. enough um, already. Okay, all right. Maybe that's fine the audience, you guys. Yeah. Um, the, uh, um, but let me ask you about the costumes. Um, okay. The, uh, 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 the austerity of those costumes. I mean, you took a... a an, a court where, you know, in the old days, costumes would, you know, in the old days, what you were wearing was critically important to your social status, which was critically important to your life. Unlike today? No, no, today, <laughs> but I mean, look at you and me. We're supposed to be the stars of this show. You've got on a wrinkled shirt uh, Joan, and a pair wait, of Bermudas. Joan, wait a second, except I'm fully chic. The, <laughs> <laughs> My outfit probably cost under a hundred dollars. Oh, I'm it, well. You're you, well. Yeah. That's another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, uh, no. Uh, but what I'm saying is, you uh, all, all the three milieu, the the shipyard, the 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 witch's den, and the court. Everyone wears the same outfit. Right. Well, they're all the same people, of course. But I mean, they don't change clothes. Right. Um, and. Uh, they just hitch their, uh, their tunic differently. In the, in the shipyard, they pull the tunic so mm -hmm. that it looks like pants. Tell me, can you explain what they do and the, what the difference is between the way the witches hitch? No, I want that to be seen. <laughs> all right. The, Here's what happens. The, people wear sarong, full, it's all yeah. black. Here's the thing. It was also not without a little nod to the great Martha Graham. Yes. Okay. Um, that it's... It's modern dance. It's also, you know, it, 
when we first did the show, we don't do it this way anymore because I was in, uh, in Brussels, we would do this show only for weeks and then do another show. You know, it wasn't in repertory, it was in, oh. it was in uh, stagione. At, so you would do a show and then you prepare the next show. That's what's so expensive and that's what, why European opera productions and dance productions can be so detailed and so expensive because you install the show and you do it as opposed to the mat where you're doing seven operas in a week and do this turnover. So this piece was installed at the theater so everyone in the, in the company dyed uh, his hair black. Everybody had jet black hair for this show. Done. That's what we did because that's all we were going to perform. So everyone dyed his hair black and we had the makeup was pale, black eyes, red lips. That's it. And uh, black fingernails. No, red fingernails. Who has? I don't know. Red fingernails for the chorus. Aeneas has black fingernails. Dido has gold fingernails. And everybody wears a black uh, top and a black sarong. That's it. Oh, and gold earrings. Everybody has gold earrings. Um, Aeneas is the only one who is without a shirt because he's from somewhere else and he's more vulgar. Um, but really, so it was just these facts, these elements, black, white, and red. Here's this whole story being told by these, this company of players. So it's not dress up. It needn't be dress up. It's full acting. And the singers do the same thing. You have to sound different. It's the same singers who are doing Belinda and the First Woman are also the First and Second Witch. They have to sing differently, which is something that's gone out of style in the opera world. You don't, you sound like Kathy Battle, whatever piece you're in. You know, it's like, and now here I am, Kathy Battle, <laughs> singing Kathy Battle. With, you know, in, you know, in the sidebar, it's I'm Cleopatra or, you know, whatever I am. But, and Kathy, ba Kathy Battle's an easy topic, but it could be a lot of people. It's like, I sing like this. And, you know, so people are missing the fun and the interest of the disguise sequences in all of these crazy operas, you know, in Mozart in particular. It's like, why would I mistake you for her? You, you sound like you, even though you're dressed weird and it's nighttime. So that kind of thing is a lot gone. From, from opera and from dance, like Odette and Odile, it's the same person dancing nasty instead of sweet. But, you know, really, you're, I am whatever my name is, you know, the Smith Nova, whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's what this piece is about. It's about acting in a certain way. So Dido and Aeneas, it's not just changing your hair, it's changing your posture and your breathing and your approach and your dynamic. It's thrilling. And everyone in the chorus does that exact same thing, too. So that takes a very high level of skill, and it's something that's hard to get. That's all. So it's, it's meant to be, you know, the, the best musical ever written, well, okay, amongst the best five musicals ever written, let's go, um, The Fantastics in its original production is the tired old drama school thing of the black apple crate and the construction paper and the piano. And that's, what, that's how you make the piece happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did partly because I had a gigantic budget, I decided to make it as simple and direct as possible. That's what was, when I was yeah. thinking about this today. It's like, here, let me throw more money at this. It was so ironical. The, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> the, yeah. Uh, I thought about it, I wrote, you know, the, I looked up the costume credit, and it was Christine Van Loon. Yeah, um, which means me. That's I was my secret say, name. Yeah. Um, Christine Van Loon was the costume constructor. She was wardrobe. Yeah, 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 at the Monet, but I thought to myself, you could have had anything you wanted for that. I know I could have had Carl Lagerfeld. <laughs> you, <laughs> the, I didn't need Carl. And you, you, I designed it. Exactly, and, and you got a Christine executed it. You Same got, with Allegro, I designed yeah, it exactly. Allegro. Exactly, but That's you, okay. right before Dido, you had, you know, $30,000 worth of silk chiffon um, uh, for gowns La for L'Allegro. Right. That I also designed. Yes, and yeah. and here you had a dollar three eighty worth of black muslin tunics. Uh huh. Yeah. All right. In sarong. Please say sarong. Sarong. I'm okay. sorry. It's sarong. Okay. Well, I don't say sarong the way you. I do. say sarong because I'm a pretentious yeah. fag and yeah. I overpronounce yeah. everything. <laughs> I say Blagojevich. <laughs> I'm sorry. I do. I say Levin boy. Um. Uh, We're fine. Wait, no. We're fine. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, the, I'm, I've done... I'm sorry. You've been... I, I need an FM radio show, the way I pronounce stuff. I'm the, sorry. The, uh, That's what I do. The, uh, uh, I say chaise longue. 
you know, it's, it's very hard. My mother always said Shay's Lounge. Chase and Lounge, yeah. Chase no, my mother said, oh, my mother oh. said Shay's Lounge. Oh, yeah, okay. And whenever I say, now I say, I think I say Shay's Long. And I feel like Go such, all the way. I feel like such a... Go all the way. Chaise long. I feel like great. Auntie deck chair. Name or something. <laughs> deck, deck, deck chair. chair. Yeah, let's okay. get rid of... Let's de-Frenchify that. Uh, yeah. may, we, may we have questions from the audience? May we? <laughs> I'm going to bring you a mic. See, I don't want you to... I don't want to ruin everything because everybody's going to come to the show. If you no, don't, I know, you're just but I don't think this... I, I okay. Don't th I think there's a lot more in that show okay. than we... Um, Can I, I, I want to say one thing. I had re I'm exhausted because I re I'm conducting this show, by the way. I used to dance it, now I conduct it, you know, whatever. Next, I don't know what I do next. Um, next time the sniper, like <laughs> Abraham Link, I don't know. But what, uh, what happens today, I, uh, yesterday I rehearsed with the soloists in New York. We're a soloist in Continuo. Today I rehearsed with the chorus, which is fabulous. And then I worked with the orchestra and then we added the singers to that, and they're fabulous. So I'm very, very thrilled with the musical forces and how this is going. It's going to be really hot, let me just tell you that. OK, what's your question? OK. The, uh, you mentioned about your theory about the countries where they don't jump around, and you said yeah. the other ones. OK, please tell us. Uh, can you explain about your theory? I'm very, very interested. OK, a couple things. And this, you know, everybody's going to go crazy with exceptions. But we understand that that's what proves the rule, et cetera. In, in tropical climes, in sunny climes, people, because it's so hot and days are exactly the same length all the time, it, the dancing is more close to the ground and more generally undulatory, less frisky, and very often more uh, storytelling involved. Not always, but mostly. Then, in colder climates, like, for example, northern Europe, you're more likely to have to jump around. I said the Basque country because Basque dancing is all jumping. Hota is all jumping. Germany. Scandin huh? Germany also. Germany. They, Scandinavian they dancing is all hopping around. And it's fabulous and fun. I like all of it. But, you know, like, um, you know, Hungarian dancing, which is on the cusp, is more frisky and jumpy around than, for example, Macedonian dancing is. Although it's very rhythmically interesting, it's small and low. And, you know, you know it's, this isn't, you know, it's not uh, set in stone, but it's been an observation of mine. Like, the people in the north of a country above the equator think the people in the south of that same country are stupider. And that's true. There are very few exceptions. You know, it's true in Germany, in the Italy? United States. Italy? Italy? Oh, oh my absolutely. God, are you kidding? Yeah. It's like, oh, oh, the southern people, they're the dumb ones. And it's not <laughs> true. I think, yeah, maybe it's true. I don't even know. Maybe it's warmer, and so it seems lazier that you have to... England is It stays the, light longer. I don't understand it. I'm in, against it, but yeah. it seems to be true. England well. is the only exception I know in the West uh, to the rule. Well, it's too in, small. In England, they say that small. people in the north are dumb. Dumb and poor and mm -hmm. brutal. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's true in, in uh, the Southern Hemisphere, but there's so much water there that it's hard to say. But I don't know, that's been an observation. You know, it's like hot food, you know, spicy food is because of preserving it, and chilies grow there. You know, it's, and it's delicious. So, I don't know, this is just my idea. It's, you know, I think of like, you know, I think of Bournonville jumping around in that gorgeous way versus like, uh, you know, hula, which isn't that low on the equator, but it's kind of hot. So. And I, I don't know. I spend a lot of time in India watching Indian dances, and really the only jumping around Indian dances are Kattak, what the they call tribal dances, also, you know, folk dances. And Kattak is more, much more, yeah, absolutely. It may be bullshit, but it's kind of interesting to, you know. I have a question over here. Yeah. Yeah, I know that music is very important to you, and I'm curious, 20 years ago, when you did this piece in Brussels, did you have early instruments or so-called original instruments and people who were, you know, more um, uh -huh. skilled in that style of, of performance, which you will have, I assume, here, based on the people that I've seen in the roster, Robert Mealy, for example. Right. How has that changed? He's fabulous. Your... Yeah, I know he is. He's I, not. Uh, yeah. Oh, is this being recorded? Oh, I don't want to say that. <laughs> He's great. And so I'm curious, how has that changed your, your own, you know, view of your, of your dance, since I know that you, you bring those two together so, so intimately? Mm -hmm. Um, having that kind of musical style in the performance 
Has that had any influence on how you see the dance now? Well, you know, 20 years ago, let's see, what year was it 20 years ago? 89. It was just barely 15 years into the early music movement. So it hadn't yet been desanctified. It was still like the holy grail of early music. It's like no vibrato, sound like a boy. Even though you're a 40-year-old soprano, you should be ashamed of yourself because you don't sound like a boy soprano. And you know, extra granola, and you know, it was extra kooky. As I was saying in rehearsal day, it broke my heart when I learned that Dame Emma Kirkby had a microwave oven. I learned that a long time. I was like, oh no, please, don't let that be true. Um, when I first did it, this is very interesting. The first performances in Brussels, I worked with the marvelous, fabulous, good friend of mine, and I hate to use the word mentor, Craig Smith from Emmanuel Music in Boston. He was work, he was, had a gig in Brussels working with Peter Sellers, the director and friend of mine, and with my company. So the very first shows, Dido was sung by Mary Westbrook Gaya, and then by Lorraine Hunt, who was then Lorraine Hunt Lieberson, the great, 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 great mezzo. And so it wasn't played on period instruments, but it's of course with an enormous amount of period information, which I suffer from too. You know, it's something I like very much. We've done the piece also, we've done it all over the place with different conductors and different bands, sometimes on period instruments and sometimes not. It doesn't make that much difference, really. You know, uh, you know period players sometimes complain that they run out of bow too soon. It's like, well, just you know, slow down a little bit. Um, and aside from the fact that it takes seven times longer to tune than it does with modern instruments, otherwise it's, this, it's really the same thing. The sonorities are different. I've done it with big choruses and small ones. I've done it many, many different ways. And in conducting it myself, I was trained by Craig and by Jane Glover and by several people. You know, and I'm not a conductor professionally, but I'm OK. I spend so much time training conductors to conduct the way I want my work to go that it's like it saves time and some money for me to do it. So, <laughs> I learned this from doing this for so long. The dancers, frankly, talking about teaching someone, uh, teaching someone this piece as we need it for the dance, which isn't really different from the piece itself. Um, and it's very open. Conductors very often think, musicians very often think that dancers just need a beat. And that's, a beat is very helpful. But you know, if you sound like shit, that's your problem. You know, it doesn't affect the dancing. The beat actually affects the dancing. So. Um, We've done it a whole bunch of different ways where it, it works or not, and we warm it up and cool it off depending, and it stays open and interesting. But I have to tell you that the dancers, um, we can do the whole piece with just a pianist, and the dancers can sing every part of the piece and know every word, every rhythm, because we've done it for so long. And it, the personnel changes, but really we can do, it doesn't sound great, but it doesn't sound bad. And you know, if you're singing, which one and which two, you know those parts vocally. You just, you have to because that's what you're dancing. Aeneas is saying, you know, when, royal fair, et cetera. And the dancer's doing that. So it's maybe the horrible accusation of Mickey Mousing is true, but you know, Mickey Mouse was pretty fabulous and somebody made that up. So it doesn't make that much difference. It's something like L'Allegro where we have a version for soprano, we have a version that includes a, an alto part and it's a different arrangement and slightly different, you know, there's an, uh, an, uh, an appendix in the score that Handel wrote arrangements for different singers. We can do that. The choreography actually has to change because of the, of the play out or the, the, the words are repeated in a different way, so I have to change the text of the dance. So, no. <laughs> you. Oh wait, you need a mic because they're recording it. You can, I don't mind you if you leave, it's fine. I have to leave pretty soon too. Um, your La Just don't go away mad, oh. yeah. Your L'Allegro was such a masterpiece and it was so extraordinary in every way. I had to go see it every time it comes, I go to see it. Great. And when you're talking in the beginning about the importance of music and how that shapes what you do because you pick a piece of music for its richness, how do you go about finding the music? And you know, you must, do you listen to different types of music all the time in order to find a piece on which you're going to compose your dance? Mm -hmm. um, here's, what, here's, my, here's my story. I love music. I think music is so interesting and 
wonderful. And what's happened over the years, this is an aside, but over the years, I've started attracting a music audience as opposed to exclusively a dance audience. This is sad to say, but a dance audience is approximately this big. And a music audience is approximately this big. You figure that out. You know, I, I don't mind. If the, the dance people's like, oh, anybody could do that. That is so easy. And the music people are like, oh my god, where did that come from? It's just what I thought. You know, that's more interesting to me. I listen to music all the time. Um, in fact, lately, I've started not listening to music to sort of teach myself a lesson. I used to have music playing constantly every waking second. Now I spend long stretches of time with no music, partly because in the studio all day, I have fabulous music, because I don't use recorded music in the studio ever. I have a pianist, and sometimes I have music rehearsals, and, you know, I mean, you know with, the, with the band, with the string quartet or whatever. And so I'm working with living musicians all the time. I have a music life, and I make up dance. Every, every class in my school has a living musician playing the piano or singing or drumming or something. It's fantastic. You're five years old, you go to class, and there's real music. Hooray, that doesn't happen that much. So I, I have a big catalog of music in my tiny mind. And I go to concerts a lot. I have friends who are musicians. I have friends who are conductors and composers. And I just, I'm lucky enough to live in New York. And I, I have a fabulous music life. So there's always something I'm interested in choreographing music. There's also things that I think I'll do and I end up just throwing out. Or something I love to listen to, but I would never imagine dancing to. So it's sort of from every angle, music is bombarding me. The orvorm that lives in my head at all times, you know. Did that one answer that at all? OK. Absolutely. One last question here. In okay. um, I'm glad you, she asked that one first, because I want to know when you're going to do Allegro again. Any answer? We just did in Berkeley, uh, California. Well, Next on the is East London. Coast, uh, London's nice. You should go there. It's probably, you know, when is that? Next spring or something? Yeah, April at uh, English National, at the Coliseum in London. I don't know when it'll happen. We do it once or twice a year for the last many years. It's just in different cities all the time. So if you live one place, you don't know that we're doing it, but we know that we're doing it. <laughs> so I don't know. Check the website, mmdg.org, and you'll know everything. Joan, is there one last quick There's question that you have? One last question, and that's Okay. That's Anybody? It. Anybody? Oh, I thought we went till 7. No, no, no. Oh, OK, it's fine with me. Any you more know, questions? Uno mas, there. Oh, right here. There. Hi, you were saying that you liked both older music and vocal music. Have you ever thought about doing anything to Monteverdi? Well, I have. Not just thought of, done. Yeah. I did a gorgeous set of madrigals, mostly male madrigals. The piece is, what's the piece called? I don't want to love. Non voglio amare. Yeah, I, I adore and worship Monteverdi. No, but things come and go. It's around. You can look it up. No, I, it, that's, we did it for a long time with, on tour with a group called Artag. And uh, I first did it with a un, then unknown brilliant uh, conductor when we first, we premiered it at the Edinburgh Festival years ago. And it was with the now become super famous genius conductor, uh, Rinaldo Alessandrini. So. Oh, no, I'm a big Monteverdi queen. Are you kidding? <laughs> I love that. Oh, my god. I like a lot of stuff. Is that the end? I, Should we wrap it up? Yeah. I think we're going to wrap it up. We'll see you all at the University Theater for the performances. Schubert, Schubert Theater, excuse oh me. Oh, my god. I, Schubert <laughs> Theater. I was testing. I was testing. Don't be late. There's no I, intermission. It's not that long. That's right. We know you have a busy day tomorrow. Mark Morris, Joan Acachella. Thank you. <laughs>